we like to talk about things we're going to be watching for, you know, things that could be different this week than they were last week. So um, do you want to start with offense or defense? Um, we could start with offense. Look at you. Look, look yeah. at you go. Okay. Yeah. What, one of the, I, I think one of the most important things looking ahead to this game on Saturday, Daniel Parker's going to be back, right? What BV said he missed with the sniffles. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what that means, but I'm glad he's going to be back in the game, which him being available on Saturday if you if you watched OU's offense closely against UTEP, they were pretty much in one personnel group, right? They they played eleven personnel essentially the entire game with Braden Willis being the only tight end that played. You know when when the game was still in the balance, but we so we haven't seen any of their twelve personnel stuff so far in the season because Daniel Parker was not available. It's going to be really interesting to see how Jeff Levy breaks up the personnel groupings, like how much 12 personnel are they going to use? How different does the offense look, you know, from a schematic standpoint, when Daniel Parker and Braden Willis are on the field, how much is Daniel Parker going to be the tight end on the field in their 11 personnel stuff? Right? Do they want to give get Braden Braden Willis some breaks here and there, and have Parker be the only tight end out there? This is this is a really interesting storyline heading into this game for me. I don't I don't know how much they necessarily want to show, right? Because Kent State is is going to be drastically overmatched in this football game, but I, I do think you want to start getting into playing in your personnel groupings that you feel are your strongest. And I think they feel 12 is so. And if, if you don't understand personnel groupings, it's number of running backs, then number of tight ends. So 12 is one running back, two tight ends. So if anyone was confused about that, but I, it's going to be interesting to see if they feel 12 is their be best personnel grouping. You got to start working on it, right? I mean, you got to start throwing it out there in games. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt about that. You, you, I, surprise is uh, something that's really good in football as it is in, in, in any competition, but there's plenty of 12 personnel on, on film from Levy's previous stops. Like if you roll up in 12, it's not going to shock anyone. Uh, so yeah, it's nice to go out there, work some of the kinks out. I'll tell you why I'm, why I'm excited. Brayden Willis was the player of the game. I picked him as the player of the game after the broadcast. Um, Venables tonight on the coaches show said that Brayden Willis was his favorite player from week one. Well, Daniel Parker is like, like almost the equivalent of, of what you're going to get whenever it comes to the block blocking aspect. Uh, you know, some may argue he's better. So, you add that to the mix, like that can mean some really, really impressive things for OU's run game. And also not to mention, Brain Willis played more snaps than anyone else on offense. And I thought he played all of those snaps with a high motor, high energy, uh, high level of execution. Imagine if he's able to spell out every now and then, catch a breather or two, and then come back in the game to have a fresh, tight end out there that, with the blocking ability and and level of play that you get from both Daniel Parker and Braden Willis is, is going to help take this offense to the next level. I'm with you. And that's why I, I can't wait to see what it looks like. So uh, another thing I'm really interested to see in this game, Kent State has switched their defense, right? They hired Jeremiah Johnson, their new defensive coordinator. He is implementing the 335 there at Kent State. So, you know, a lot of people want to call it the Iowa State style of defense, right? And OU sees a lot of that in the Big 12, man. I mean, there's all kinds of teams in this conference running it. So that is not what UTEP did, right? UTEP was a 425 team. I mean, that's that's kind of what their base 
structure is this is going to be a structure of a defense that this team's going to see more of in the Big 12. Now, Kent State does not have a bunch of elite personnel on the defensive side of the ball. I'm not going to make it sound like they do, but from a structural standpoint, this is a scheme that I want to see how they perform against, right? And because this is Levy's new offense, you're not, you're seeing, he saw some of it, not quite as much of it in the SEC. So I'm just, I'm just kind of interested to see how he attacks it, you know? Yeah, no, I totally agree. And, you know, some people may, may disagree, but I feel like you, like the best way, and it's really no different than any other defense, I guess, whenever you think about it, but you have to absolutely punish them in the running game. You have to punish them in the running game and, and feel, make them feel like they have to come out of the big shell coverages uh, where they can keep everything in front of them in the passing game. They have to come out of that in order to force your hand in the running game and get some stops at the line of scrimmage to keep you um, to where you're somewhat predictable. That's what they want. They want to, to keep everything in front of them, you know, force you to have to inch it down the field. Hope, hopefully at some point you make a critical mistake, you get a penalty, there's a holding call, you get behind the chains and, and they can, uh, they can get a stop. If you can run the ball for five or six yards of carry, it don't matter, right? If you can blow them off the line of scrimmage, it doesn't matter what they're in. And you can, you can really start to dictate and force them into some aggressive fronts. And that way you can take advantage of your skill position talent and start pushing the ball down the, down the field to make them pay. Yeah. And you know, one thing to keep an eye on just watching Kent state's opener against Washington, they, they just got murdered by Washington on like 15 to 20 yard throws to the sideline, just massive gaping holes in their coverage there. And Michael Penix just like threw it there over and over and over again. And they had chunk play after chunk play after chunk play. I would assume they'll, they'll sure some of that up after just getting completely exposed by Washington with it. But I I would not be surprised to see OU test that area of the field early and often because, man, they showed a just glaring weakness in coverage in that area. Well, and it'll be difficult for them, you know, because our slot guy in MIMS is, is going to make that the overhang player want to show him a lot of attention before he releases and gets out underneath number one receiver. And if you got a big arm quarterback that's accurate and can thread that in there, you can make those type of throws all day long. So, yeah, it's, it's you know, you put them in a tough spot. They start overplaying and getting out of there too quickly. You start maybe trying to pick them apart in the, the you know, the middle of the field, the underneath stuff. But, yeah, I, I'm interested to see what Libby's game plan is. I, I, you know, kind of. You know, watching them against a traditional style of defense, you got kind of traditional style offense. Curious to see how this goes. I mean, I, my biggest thing is the offensive line needs to have a really big day because it doesn't matter what offense it is and it doesn't matter what defense it is. If you can move guys off the line of scrimmage and get the running game going, that's where it all starts. Yeah, sounds like it's it's going to be a tough week of practice for those guys along the offensive line. Uh, some emphasis on finishing a little better. So, yeah, I would expect them to to play at a higher level in, in this one. And you expect the same starting lineup? Yeah, I really don't. I, I just don't know if you can trust Savion Bird at, to start him out there at left guard. Like, I, I just don't know if you do, if you can. I'll, yeah. I'll tell you this. Beatonbow is reevaluating every single guy every single day on the practice. Like that's, that's how he operates anyways. But until Wanye comes back, which, you know, BV talked about it. There really no update on that off the field issue for him. I, I I feel like you got to put your five best that you trust the most out there. And I would expect it to look the same. I think. 
Yeah. Will I be shocked if it looks different? No. I mean, uh, Savion Bird, I think, could be, you know, the best guard on this team. But if you can't trust him to do everything right each snap, then eh. where did where did Taylor play? Did he play guard or did he play tackle? He Jake played Taylor. right guard. And with Chris Murray being a captain this game, I got a feeling Chris is going to be getting the old nod at right guard. Yeah. Because, you know, someone asked a question. We took like a Academy Sports and Outdoors question. And the question was, who of the guys, the younger guys that played in the game Saturday, who do you think earned more time in, in this next upcoming game? And he went through, he said like Gavin Freeman and some of those guys. And he said Jake Taylor. So I don't know what that means. If it means anything at all, maybe not, but. Um, that was at least something I'll tell you right now with the way that Matower and Conjo played at left guard, stick him at left guard. Let's see what the kids got. <laughs> like, I mean, <laughs> I, I would have no problem with that. Like, let's see yeah. if he sinks or swims. I, I'd be all for it. But the, the only, I think the only other question I have offensively is w- with this style of defense that Kent state's about to play, right. Bunch of deep zone how does Dylan Gabriel handle it? Right. Like how, how does he operate against this style? Does he force some throws? Does he, is he patient? Like how, how does he go through his progressions? Like he, he's going to have to play some, I mean, it sounds dumb, but he's going to have to play some quarterback in this game. They're not just going to give him a bunch of deep shots. And I'm sure Levy's going to try his best to scheme some of those up, but he is he's going to have to play boring quarterback at some points in this game and just wonder what it's going to look like for him no i i agree it it's interesting you know this this style of defense was hell on lincoln riley's system right and you know a lot of the quarterbacks that we've had have had a really hard time you know just taking what they give you and being you know, you get so used to the the go, go, go mentality and big chunk plays and pushing it down the field and, you know, hitting big explosive runs that whenever that doesn't happen right out of the gate, you start to get antsy and they bait you into forcing some throws that you just don't need to make. So, yeah, we'll see. This is this is it's an interesting test really on both sides of the ball for OU, you know we'll get to the defense, but it, it's just, it's such a stark contrast to week one with what we're going to get in week two stylistically. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Let's, let, let's talk some defense. So as you, as you look at OU's defense heading this game, what kind of, you know, questions, comments, what, what, what do you got? Well, um, I think it's interesting, you know, just kind of looking at the scheme that, that Kent state is going to present, um, you know, it's going to, there's going to be a lot of similarities to some of the stuff that, that we see in this conference from teams. And, you know, it's going to be different than UTEP. UTEP was slow, get in the huddle, line up, wait till you get lined up, wait till you get adjusted, look over to their sideline. They say, yeah, that's, yeah, we're fine to run a play against this. And then you run a play. It's not what it's going to be against Kent State. It's going to be breakneck speed, super fast. They're not waiting on you for anything. They're going to be snapping the ball really quickly. So you've got to get lined up. You've got to get ready to play and and be ready for that next snap. Um, They've got really good skill guys, uh, way better skill guys than what we just faced. they got a quarterback that is a dual threat guy. He can make you pay in the run game. They'll have plenty of run game dialed up for him. you know, and, you know, just talking with Coach Venables, one of the things that they do, and this is this is what really hammers defenses that are not experienced whenever they split your defense by, you know, they'll run the quick motion, fake the quick to this side, and run quarterback counter or another play back to the other side. And the secondary is adjusting to, the quick motion and then you know you've got the play action that way and then you've got like a quarterback counter 
it's a lot going on and you really have to have your eyes in the right place to know exactly what your responsibility is. So, you know, this is going to be more of a test this week mentally than it is physically. Now, physically, like the, the up-tempo, the conditioning aspect of it, the, can you think, can you process information whenever you're winded? Like that's going to be a physical challenge, but mentally knowing where you're going to be knowing what your responsibility is is going to be quite a bit tougher than it was week one yeah and uh, i think they call it the fast flash offense yeah. right and the guy the guy that is the head coach for kent state sean lewis was with dino babers which is pretty much i mean that's levy's offense right so you're you're looking you're looking at a kent state offense that runs a very similar style kind of spread you out, do a lot of different things to you. Like, like Oklahoma does now under Levy. So so, so it's, it's going to be interesting, but one of the things that, and and I know this may sound stupid, but people have been complimenting the defense pretty much all week, right? You tackled well, Hey, this is, you know, the, OU's getting back to playing great defense. Like, how do they respond to hearing all that stuff? Like, and and I know Venables is the ultimate like rehumble you and get you focused coach, but these kids are still seeing that stuff all over social media and hearing it, hearing it from their friends and all that stuff. So I, I'm just interested to see, you know, how do they respond to you know having a pretty successful opening performance, right? I, I think that's that's only natural to wonder. And then the tempo stuff is interesting because handling tempo and practice is one thing they practice against it all the time. Right. But it's different on game day. It just is right. It's different. I mean, the coaches are for the, and the coaches are way farther away, right out way out on the sideline. And you're trying to get everything. It's just chaos out there. So I I am interested to see how efficiently they handle how fast Kent State's offense wants to go. No, I I agree. Um, And that's going to be the problem, right? That's going to be the that's going to be the the big adjustment from week one to week two. Now, (laughs) judging off of of what Coach Vittable said to not at the coaches show, I don't think we have to worry about them uh, seeing how they respond to, to some success. Uh, <laughs> Toby asked him how practice went and he started laughing. He said, you want the truth? <laughs> so I think it was the classic. You think you played well, you know, welcome to back down to reality where coach, the staff makes it a point. Uh, whenever you think you you went out there and, and had a, a fairly sharp game that they're going to make life miserable that week. And it, that's kind of the impression that I got, um, which is a good thing because it, it is a big challenge, but you're right. The communication aspect, this is always going to be first and foremost, whenever you're playing a team that is uh, plays at a breakneck speed, but you got to remember everyone out there, it's still, their first time in this defense and there's a lot of new starters right and you know you've you've got some experience out there but there's also some guys that are that are still working through things and still maybe trying to find their voice and you know you always want communication but a lot of times you don't get communication because everyone out there is so worried about trying to figure out what it is that they're supposed to do that they're not communicating a whole lot else. They're just worried about, gosh, I just need to be in the right place. And I kind of feel like that's maybe where we are at this point in time in this defense. It's going to get better, and the more opportunities you get in games, uh, you expect that to continue to to increase, and and they're going to look better from from one week to the next. And I hope that's the case this week because if not, you know, this is a little bit different than than UTEP. If you're scattered out there and you got guys that are not all on the same page, they can make you look really bad really quickly with some explosive plays. Yeah. And I mean, last thing defensively for me, 
Kent State wants to run the football, right? And you look, they were the third leading rushing team in FBS last season. Right? Marquez Cooper, their running back, he, he's a solid back. Uh, but Colin Schley, which is just an awesome name for a quarterback, <laughs> he, just from what I saw from him against Washington, He's not a, you know, he's not a home run threat as a runner, but they're going to dial up some QB run game uh, for him. And I'm, I'm really interested to see how, how OU's defense handles that, right? It's, yeah. it's going to be, didn't see that against UTEP, right? Haven't seen it. Um, so that, that's really the big question for me. Dante Cephas, their wide receiver, that guy can play. I mean, 14 yeah. for, for Kent State can play, but. I think if if they can shut down this rushing attack for Kent State, that this defense is going to be a really good spot in this football game. Totally agree. That's going to be that's going to be first and foremost, and shutting down the run and getting after the quarterback. Uh, if you could put pressure on him, make life really difficult, and not let him get going in the running game, guys are going to have to tackle really well. Um, you know, what worries me is the deep ball. That's the, you know, I keep talking about the contrast in styles. Kent State is going to throw it deep on you a bunch. And UTEP didn't push it downfield, I don't think, one time. So you're going to have to be ready on the outside. Our corners are going to get tested. Our safeties are going to get tested. Um, you know, our backers are going to get really tested in some of the running game and the misdirection. And, you know, and can they help it out on some of the RPO stuff? I mean, they're going to throw a lot at you at a, at a really quick pace. So this is, it's, I think this is actually like the way that the non-conference is working out is I think it's a really good mix and you can kind of see where you stand against a couple of different styles, you know, including what you're going to see from Lincoln or uh, from Nebraska in Lincoln. Yeah. And Kent state, like, they they played for the MAC title last year. Yeah, I mean they're picked. They, they were picked, picked preseason their, yeah. to win their division again. So yep. uh, I mean it's not it's not like they're some god awful program. So no, uh, they're gonna no. they're they've been top five or top ten. I think last year I think they were right around the top ten, and the two years previous I think they were top five offense in the in the country. Yeah, so uh, gonna be an interesting test for the defense. All right.